How did you uh, do the thing with the, the microphone? Yeah, the yeah, He's got to do the thing with the microphone. Yeah, the if I the thing, you can't hear. That's true. And then they tell them on Facebook, yeah, hey, I can't hear you. Good morning. How's everybody today? Here, good job, good job. I only received one extra credit paper on the Athanasian Creed this week, so <laughs> if you feel like you need some extra credit in church, uh, review the Athanasian Creed and uh, submit that paper to me. I got a text, it was a long text. Um, you can do it by email, you can do it uh, with regular paper. <clears throat> uh, a couple of uh, things just to start off, I wanna thank you. Um, and, and I want to thank just everybody in general um, for your, your financial co contributions. You know, this is the end of the year where we look and, and start doing budget things. It's always exciting to review the budget, right, Pam? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a yee-haw from the back of the room. Maybe you didn't all hear it, but, um, but I just want to thank you for your contributions through the year. Um, there are a number of different ways. I have the luxury of having my, my tithes deducted from my paycheck, so uh, that's kind of easy for me. But I do understand what it means to go work a job and then take from what you've earned, your hard-earned money, and give to the church. So we thank you very much for that. Uh, you can give online, you can give through checks, you can give cash. Uh, we actually also have an Amazon Smile account, so if you, if you shop on Amazon, you can look us up on Amazon Smile and you can, they, they'll contribute a percentage of what you buy um, to the church. And so I think we're up to about $12 through Amazon Smile. But hey, it's $12, right? So, uh, so that's just one way. And then, um, <clears throat> so thank you. That's, I always want to be the guy that thanks you for contributing to the finances of the church. I really do appreciate it. Uh, along with that, uh, yesterday we did undecorating from Christmas, and so we had a good turnout. We had some folks come out to help undecorate and then redecorate the church for the winter season. I'm so sorry that it's winter, um, but it, we were able to get the Christmas decorations uh, taken down, so thank you for that. Uh, there will be a ministry team leader meeting tomorrow night, and I think this applies to one person who's here. So, hey, Sean, what are you doing tomorrow night at 6? That's right. Good job. It's on the calendar. Excellent. I'll see you there. Uh, and Melissa, who's downstairs, is going to help us. And the purpose of this meeting is to help set the calendar. Most of you don't need to know that, but now that you do, <clears throat> we do have a plan. Let's pray together. Oh, I'm sorry. That Secret Sister Reveal is next Sunday, January 12th. Secret Brothers, nothing has changed. And then our annual meeting is February 9th. Uh, there's going to be some important uh, discussion at that meeting. We're not doing any voting, but there will be some important discussion about 2020. Um, so I'd like to, if you're a regular attender, if you're a member, uh, please make plans to be there. Now let's pray. Now. Father, we're going to think about standing before you. It's humbling. It's humbling. But Father, I know that you accept me and you accept all of us not on the basis of what we have done but on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for us thank you Father thank you Father for giving us that freedom and so Lord as we render service to you Lord we do it as, as a free gift you've already taken care of our destiny and so help us Lord as we look into your word as we consider who we love in this series Father and help us Lord to love you truly and deeply. Father, I thank you for my friends gathered here today, my brothers and my sisters. Help us, Lord, to do your will in Christ's name. Amen. I was at a conference last year, and one of the books, uh, I, I'm a book guy. I, I'm a horrible conference attendee, but I, I'm a pretty good book guy. And so I went up to the book table where uh, one of the publishers was selling, you know, various and sundry items. And I just asked the guy who was selling the books, you know, the editor, the guy who knows all the books on the table. I said, what do you recommend? And he said, oh, let me tell you. He got excited. And he said, there's this one here. And he started giving me like the, the blurb. It's a blurb. He's selling books, right? That's okay. He says, this one is about this and it's really good and blah, blah, blah. And he said, this one, this one. 
One of the books that he recommended I read early last year, and it was just fantastic. The title of the book is You Are What You Love by James K.A. Smith. You are what you love. And this book is, is sort of helping you see the way that your loves are being hijacked. The way that your affections and your desires are being uh, sort of drawn into things that are not profitable, even are destructive to who you are as a person. And so it's an important book. The basic question that he starts off with is he says, what do you want? Because what you want reveals what you love, right? Have you ever thought about what you want? Have you ever thought about that deeply? Or with any sustained thought at all? When you do a literary analysis, when you look at a character from literature, often you can discern what that character is all about because a good writer will let you know. They won't start off with a, a sentence that says, by the way, this character wants this, but you see it in what they chase. You see it in what they focus on. And so allow me to illustrate the idea of loves using a character from literature. Okay, he's from television. Okay, it's from the Big Bang Theory. Okay, it's Sheldon Cooper. I thought that might be, like I'm trying to think, you know, how, how broad did I have to cast this net? Who's familiar with what, right? If you're not familiar with the series Big Bang Theory, it's run for 12 years. There are a couple of spinoffs. Uh, it's about a group of science nerds. And these science nerds are uh, very high-performing academics. And in addition to that, they're friends, and they're into all of the nerdy things that you would expect uh, nerds to be into, right? They have Star, Star Wars marathons. They talk about, they dress up and go to Comic Cons. They play games together, you know, three-dimensional chess. All of the nerdy things you would expect from a group of scientists. Sheldon is the one who is the most brilliant. <clears throat> but he's also the most socially awkward. And I mean, that's probably an understatement, right? To say that Sheldon is socially awkward, I mean, he doesn't get sarcasm. Who doesn't get sarcasm, right? <laughs> or humor of many different kinds. And so the show really kind of revolves around his awkwardness, his weirdness. And if you look closely, you can see some of his desires. One of his desires, is that he's an extremely picky eater. On uh, Fridays when they eat Chinese food, his friend Leonard has to go around and make multiple stops to get just the right food. You'll, if you're familiar with the show, you'll, you'll be familiar with this. His chicken and broccoli order must be diced, not shredded, even though the menu specifically says that it's going to be diced. He's gonna want brown rice, not white. Hot mustard must be purchased from the Korean grocery and the low sodium soy sauce from the market. So that's like three or four different stops with specific menu requirements. It's takeout. <laughs> Folks, I get the wrong takeout and I eat it. I ordered a steak that was brought two degrees off from what I asked for. I ate it. The waitress said, well, do you want me to take it back? No, I'm hungry. <laughs> Sheldon is not that guy. He wants things very specifically. And it's not just what he eats, it's everything. What's the room temperature supposed to be in Sheldon's apartment? 70 degrees, isn't it? 70, 72, anyway, it's gotta be this certain thing, otherwise he's just completely off his game. What does Sheldon Cooper want? More than anything else. What is the overriding theme, the focus of his academic career, the big thing that he's seeking? The Nobel Prize. He wants the Nobel Prize in Physics to be recognized as this great intellect that has made a contribution to an understanding of the world. And so the series goes 12 years with uh, you know, this ongoing theme of Sheldon getting the Nobel Prize, and at the end of the series, he gets it. He achieves his great goal. He gets what he wants. What does Sheldon Cooper love? Well, if you sort of peer through the veil, really what he loves is himself. What he's all about is his ego. That doesn't make him less endearing. We're, we can see that and be glad that he's on television and not in our friend group, right? He wants recognition. 
We could go through almost any piece of literature and analyze almost any well-written character, and we could come out with understanding what they want and thus what they love. You can do it for yourself as well. What do you want? What do you love? Sometimes this is unexamined for us. And if we don't examine what we want and what we love, there are forces in the world that are designed to hijack your loves and take you places you don't want to go. To take you and make you love things that you don't want. Because that's where your energy, your effort, your money will be directed. What does God want? What does God want out of this? He wants you to love Him. He wants you to be so in love with Him that you are looked at as a little bit crazy by the rest of the world. That's what God wants. This overriding, burning, passionate commitment to Him. And what will that require? It requires a lot of saying no to the things that will distract you. Last week we talked about how love is not squishy, right? <clears throat> love is not this squishy emotional term. Now I do hope that you have squishy emotions towards people. I'm squishy towards her, right? Right? <laughs> Affirm me, make me... Help, help. But love, the idea of love, especially in scripture, is this robust term. It goes so far beyond emotion to a deep abiding commitment so that she can have a fight with me and be completely wrong and I still love her. Or vice versa. Let's take a look at Paul's prayer for the Philippians where Paul prays for them to have an abundant knowing love. This is chapter one starting in verse nine. The book of Philippians is, a, is a, a letter in the Bible written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Philippi. He's been there. He's planted the church. He knows these people. He wants to thank them for their financial support, but he also wants to correct some dissension that's happening. You see, the church is under pressure, pressure from the world, pressure from different things. And so they're starting to have like some internal conflict. And so Paul wants to write to them about joy. And as he starts the letter, ancient letters have a, a, a pretty fixed format. Paul the Apostle writes to the city of Phil, uh, the church in Philippi. So there's a, a beginning. And in that beginning, there's often a prayer. When that normal form is interrupted, it's usually to catch your attention. But in this form here, in Philippians, Paul is going to use a standard form. And he's going to include a, a prayer of blessing. And in that prayer of blessing, there's some important information. Uh, chapter 1, verse 9 says this. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I love when we look at little tiny pieces of the New Testament because I get to do Greek stuff. And then I get to come in here and I get to talk to you about the details of the grammar. And I was sternly admonished not to do that. <laughs> so let me just comment on a few things here. You remember, we remember that love goes beyond emotion to this uh, to a, a commitment, a commitment to God, a commitment to one another. And Paul is praying that their love in this fractured and dissent, dissension church, he says, I want your love to be bigger and bigger and better and better and deeper and deeper. That's what his prayer is. And then when he says, and this is the point, like the point of this whole section, this whole little piece right here, love is the point. So don't get uh, drawn away into the other words. Remember, always come back to love being the point of Paul's prayer. He says, I want you to do this in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, when you use the preposition in, what does that mean? It can mean a number of different things. In this situation, it means by means of, by means of. So in order to increase your love, you're gonna to have to use knowledge and insight. Think about that for a minute. Paul is saying, if you're going to be devoted to God, if you're going to be devoted to one another, you're going to have to think about what that looks like. 
because it's not an emotion. It's not something that just wells up from your heart springs, oh baby, I love you, but I'm never going to take the trash out. No, because for me to love this woman, I have to know who this woman is. Now maybe it doesn't work for any of you other ladies in the room, I don't know. I know if I want to communicate love to her, I mop the floor. And she thinks, what a husband. I changed her brakes yesterday. Oh, she melted. Because for her, serving, doing things for her is a way that I know, I know, I had to use my knowledge, I had to figure it out. Folks, it wasn't easy. First couple of years of marriage, I'm walking around like a moron. I don't know how to love this woman. So I, I was in the Navy, so I just left a lot. <laughs> I had to figure it out. I had to figure out how to love her, how to be devoted to her, how to understand who she is and how she works. You know what? It's no different with any relationship that you have. I have to know how to love God better with all my heart and with all my soul. Because there are things that are trying to hijack my loves. By means of knowing is not the point. Love is the point. Knowledge is how we get there to increase our love. And in Christianity, we often get that wrong. So hold on to that idea. So that you may, may be able to discern what is best. That so that is for the purpose of. So knowing is for the purpose of uh, knowing what is best. The world presents you with a smorgasbord of options. What kind of TV should you buy? There's QLED, there's 4K, 8K, 9K, I don't even know. What kind of TV should you buy? Remember when there was one option? TV. You can have a... The world is constantly bombarding you with choices, and so you have to discern what is best in order to discern what it looks like to love God. Otherwise, our loves get hijacked. To discern what is best, not what is convenient or what is temporary. Because convenient and temporary things will be gone. They're gone. And one of the ways you can sort of measure this, if a six-year-old with a cell phone can do it, maybe you shouldn't. Because maybe there's an act of devotion that you need to be doing instead. Now, I'm not suggesting that you never take some time off, turn your brain off, and goof off on the internet. God bless you. Go do it. But don't make it characterize your life. Don't let it hijack your love. Don't let it be the focus of your life because it's ultimately meaningless. You're not going to stand before the Lord. He's going to say, so what did you learn about on Facebook? Did you vote for the right people? And vote for Jesus. So that you may be pure and blameless on the day of Christ. With the result of that, so the result of this increase in love that we use knowledge and discernment to get to, the result of this is that you'll be pure and blameless on the day of Christ, that you'll stand before the Lord and he'll say, well done. You made choices, hard choices, to do the right things. That's what we're shooting for, to please our Heavenly Father. Our devotion in this life gets evaluated when we stand in Christ's presence. That doesn't mean whether we get in or out. You know, we all, if you believe it, that Jesus died for your sins, you get into heaven. That's the baseline. You are God's child. But God wants you to be his obedient child. That's going to take some work. Because you have been filled with the fruit of righteousness, Paul sort of comes all the way back full circle and he says, you have been made God's child. And so what, it, what his prayer is about is an abundant love that characterizes God's obedient child. As a Christian, you're God's child. And the challenge for us is to be obedient and praiseworthy children. And so what I've done, I've taken the liberty of, of producing a, a retranslation of Philippians 1, 9 through 11. <clears throat> now this is not the authorized version. This is me helping, the, bringing the grammar to you. And I can defend all of the choices that I've made here and would be happy to do so. <laughs> do I see a hand? Like this. this is my prayer. 
that you use knowledge and insight to discern the best things and greatly increase your devoted love for God. Knowledge is a tool, insight is a tool, so that you can do what is best and thus increase your devotion and passion and love for God. Doing this will establish you pure and blameless on the day of Christ, something we all look for, right? Where you will stand because you are already filled with the righteousness of Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is my prayer, that you use knowledge. Love is the main verb here. Love is the point. A robust, committed, full devotion to God. So often in Christianity, we, we sort of make the mistake of making knowledge the thing that we're supposed to do. When we think about our discipleship, when we think about what we're going to do you know, from the pulpit or in our small groups, we think about what are we going to learn, what are we going to know. That's only part of what's going on here. That's only a part of what God wants from us. Love is the point. Smith says this, if we're going to discern what is best, what is excellent, what really matters, what is of ultimate importance, Paul tells us that the place to start is by attending to our loves. By sitting down with yourself and thinking through what is it that I want, what is it that I love. Augustine, an early Christian writer and thinker, says this, my weight is my love. Wherever I am carried, my love is carrying me. Now, for Augustine, what this means, it's the natural desire. And so he looks at the world around him and he says, look, a stone sinks in accordance with its weight. Smoke rises in accordance with its weight in its character. Its character pulls in a certain direction. Imagine when an object is uh, pushed or pulled against its desire. Take a ball, for example. What happens when you take a ball and push it underwater? It wants to rise. Because of buoyancy? Any science teachers in the room? Because of buoyancy. The ball wants to rise. It's been pushed against its weight. You're created in God's image. Your weight is to be his child, his obedient child. We're different than balls. We're different than stones and we're different than smoke in this. Your loves can be trained. Your loves can be hijacked. Your loves can be stolen. So discipleship is more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. Jesus' command to follow him is a command to align our loves and longings with his, to want what God wants, to desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God and crave a world where he is all in all. What's your Nobel Prize? What's your love? Where do you invest your time? Where do you invest your money? Where do you invest your passions? Now, I'm not suggesting that we all have to be like, okay, I'm going to go to seminary and study, and that's not for everybody. I get that. What I am suggesting is that whoever you are as a person, as a Christian, your desires need to be trained and oriented towards God so that you follow the weight of your true self. Without a disciplined understanding and conditioning of our loves, we run the risk of having them hijacked. I've had a couple moments of clarity this past year. Thanks to Smith and some other things I've been reading. You'll hear, you've heard these kinds of things before. You'll hear them again. Don't spend too much time doing things that are automatic. Switch your brain off from time to time. By all means. But don't let your life be characterized by brainless activity. If a six-year-old with a cell phone can do it, you probably don't need to. Or you need to do it a little bit. One of the things I've done, I've taken Facebook off my phone. I'm still on Facebook, but if you're trying to get a hold of me, you're going to have to make that thing ring. I won't answer it. <clears throat> Certain times of the day, you know why? Because my disciplined love for God requires certain things get my attention, my uninterrupted attention. Facebook, Reddit, Insta, Snap, whatever, I'm using less and less time of my time on these things because they don't align with my loves. They don't align with what I want to be characterized by. They don't help me love God more. They hijack those loves. 
and misuse them. I want to read better things more deeply. Every book that you read should be given the attention it deserves. I read some books this year that were just, this is not worth my time. And so I just kind of flipped through it, hit the highlights, set it aside. There are other books I want to read again and again and again. I want to read better things more deeply this year. Maybe you're not much of a reader. Maybe what you need to do is look for the best um, information the best informational content that you can digest well. It's not enough to listen to a bunch of sermons. Listen to the good sermons. Like this one. Like this one. <laughs> Soon to be available on YouTube. I want more quality in my quality time with my family. I don't want to be thinking as I'm sitting at home and I'm, Ezekiel comes up and he says, read me a book. We're working through the Captain Underpants series, if you're wondering. Um, <laughs> I want to be able to say, yes, let's read Captain Underpants and read him the whole book because I love him. I want to make sure I'm spending time with my wife. Date night is date night. I want to condition my loves. Ultimately, because I love God. You know what God, te God tells me to do? Husbands love your wives. Well, okay, I guess. I guess. Some of these are jokes, people. <laughs> as a community of faith, as a church, I want our love for God to be so evident in the things that we do and the people that we spend time with so that we as a community, when we say we love God, people go, man, those people really love God. How can you tell? What do they do? What do they want? They want to love God. They want to do the things that matter. So that our love, our devoted enthusiasm for him breaks out in everything that we do. So that we become a community of people metaphorically on fire for God. So nobody has to wonder, hey, is the spirit there? No, the spirit's there. God's spirit. You can tell when it's love. Really loving these things some of these are personal for me. Really loving these things means choosing other things above them. Choosing the good things. Discerning. Using my knowledge to know what is best. Using what is best to condition my love so that I say no to the things that hijack my loves and yes to the things that increase my love for my family and for my God. That's what I think Paul prays for his community in Philippi. That's what I think we should pray for ourselves. God help us love you more. To do that, we have to challenge to do this. To use knowledge and discernment to greatly increase our devoted love for God, we have to think about some of the assumptions that we have as people. We have to challenge these assumptions because we're not just brains in buckets. We're more than thinking things. And so there is a problem of thinking thingism for abundant love. Thinking is good, but that's not everything that we do or everything that we are. In the 1600s, Rene Descartes, okay, now you're like, oh, well, here he goes, history again. But as soon as I say this next part, you're going to be like, oh, that guy. He says, I think, therefore I am. Descartes was a philosopher who tried to doubt everything. He said, I'm going to, he, he wanted to just have pure thoughts. And so he said, okay, I'm going to doubt everything. Am I in this room? I don't know. A little bit weird, but philosophers are like that. And so he doubted everything until he got to the point where he said, I am thinking. How do you know that you're thinking, Descartes? He maybe didn't ask that question. And he said, if I'm thinking, I must exist. And so he said, that's the foundation. That, that I can work from there. And I can take that first principle. If I think that I exist, I must be a thinking thing. And as a thinking thing, I can think to other things and I can build a worldview. That's not necessarily bad. We might choose other starting places. In philosophy, these kinds of philosophies often trickle down. And so for Descartes, I think therefore I am set up a model of who we are as people. And that idea starts in the academic world of philosophy and it sort of trickles down, trickles down, trickles down. And it gets critiqued up here, and all of those critiques sort of trickle down, trickle down, trickle down. You're not just a thinking thing. Although, 
When you think about the way that the church deals with growing as Christians, when you think about what we do for discipleship, how often do we do thinking things? All the time. The model of thinking thingism sets up a model of Christian growth and develop that is incomplete. We are more than brains on a stick. Smith says this, such an intellectualist model of the human person, one that reduces us to mere intellect, assumes that learning, and hence discipleship, is primarily a matter of depositing ideas and beliefs in the mind of the So I, I forgot a couple things today. <clears throat> they were on my checklist. Imagine there's a bucket. Okay? okay? You with me? Yeah. Bucket. Got a bucket? Yeah. And a stack of books. Okay. Yeah. Stack of books. Got it. Okay. The first book is a Bible. And if I, if I want to be a good disciple of Christ, I'm going to need that Bible, right? So I'm going to take it and I'm going to drop it into that bucket. That bucket is you. That bucket is your brain. Okay, good. We've got a Bible in there. Okay, now we need some good theology. Pick up that book of theology and cram it into somebody's head. And then we pick up some philosophy, because philosophy and theology are kind of cousins. We throw some philosophy in there. And then we go back over here and, hmm, what are we missing? Some practical stuff, right? Some practical tools, how to decorate the church. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, we'll put that into our bucket full of things. How to do, that was not in my pastoral competencies class, by the way. <laughs> Neither was folding tables and moving chairs. And so we have this idea that we're thinking things and there's this bucket full of ideas. It doesn't do anything. But think big thoughts. And aren't you called to do more than just think thoughts? Stay tuned. There's a Bible verse for that. God wants you to think. God wants you to think. Knowing the Bible is a good foundation. Knowing theology is good for you. Knowing practical things is good for you. There are any number of fields that are good for you to know and to know about. But God wants us to be more than thinking things. If you are what you think, then filling your thinking organ with Bible verses should translate into Christ-like character. Right? If we fill that bucket full of thinking thing things... That is what yields a good Christian, right? If you are what you think, then changing what you think should change who you are, right? There's a gap. And anybody who's ever lived for more than five minutes knows there's a gap between what you think and what you do. Anybody do something you're not supposed to do this week? Everybody do something you're not supposed to do this week? You know, if we were just thinking things, there wouldn't be industrial accidents like Chernobyl. They would have thought the right thoughts and hit the right button. We don't need less knowledge, we need more. The Bible tells us to think. The Bible also tells us to be people characterized by virtue. Virtues are habits of life that cross the gap between knowledge and and obedience. Consider Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive each other. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So if Paul tells me in Philippians to increase my love, and if love is binding together the virtues of compassion and kindness, humility and gentleness, then the habits that we form, the disciplined behaviors that we bring into our life are the thing that take us from being a bucket full of ideas to a person who's able to engage the world and the people around us. Let's try something. This is a social experiment. Um, maybe a little awkward for some of you, but just hold on with me, all right? I want you to think compassion. Got it? Think some compassion right inside your head. Think compassion, okay? Now, without using any other part of your body, I want you to beam that compassion to somebody else. Whoa! Nothing just happened. 
Because compassion is not something you think, it's something that you do. It's something that you do. You've got to take that stuff in the bucket, all those good things, the Bible, theology, practice, you've got to take all of that and do something with it in order for someone to feel compassion. Paul's metaphor here for putting on clothing is a daily habitual practice. Put on compassion. That means you have to get up and decide to do it. Decide to be compassionate. Decide to be kind. Decide to be humble. And you know what happens when you make it a daily habit of doing those things? It becomes automatic. So that as you are going through your life and you see someone who is needing compassion, you have the ability because you've trained the ability. You've created the habit of being compassionate. Habitual daily practice crosses the gap between knowing what God wants us to do and actually doing it. You see, Christianity needs a broader picture of what it needs. Modern Christianity, not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is the source of what we do in modern Christianity. We need to move beyond being thinking things to being people who are filled with the virtues and character qualities that define or that describe what love really is. God wants our intense devotion. He wants us to do things because we are more than what we think. We are what we love. <clears throat> this past week, I pulled into my driveway and there were people in my driveway that I wasn't expecting. I was supposed to be expecting them. They were on the calendar. And so I got out of my car and I said, Hi, can I help you? They were a homeschool family. And they had four boys. And so it was a minivan, of course. Um, you know, big sticker on the back. Honk if you love Jesus or whatever. Um, it was the, yeah, I, I won't say their name because we're broadcasting. Lee and Marilyn. And they said, we're here to see Mrs. Fred. Now, Mrs. Fred is the online persona. She is the English teacher who teaches 250 students online. And she is internet famous. She's royalty, folks. I don't know if you know what, what you've got sitting in the front pew, but she's amazing. She teaches English to little kids literally across the globe. And sometimes they just show up at my house. And Mrs. Fred was uh, not feeling well. So I said, well, let me go in and check and see how, how she's doing if she's able to get up and, and spend some time with you. And she was. There were four boys, three former students, and one who was soon to be subjected to English grammar and composition by Mrs. Fred. You know, my wife has wanted to be an English teacher since she was a little girl. She has wanted to teach uh, probably a couple different things, but she knew she wanted to be a teacher. And English is the area where her desires, her loves, her wants have just pulled her into. And she's excellent at it. She's been doing it for a thousand years now. She loves the way the language works from the roots of grammar to the way an essay makes, makes sense. She can teach you how to write a thesis sentence, put enumerations on it, and get good grades in seminary. Because she did that for me. She's also my number one editor because she knows where the commas go. I don't need to know where the commas go. I just need to make her read my stuff. Some of her students have gone on to academic careers, earning PhDs in advanced fields, writing speeches for politicians, and they regularly will come back. Excuse me. They'll regularly come back and say thank you for what she's invested in their lives. Her love, her what she wants, and her loves have taken her into the field of teaching little kids English. She's not the Sheldon Cooper of English grammar. But I know she loves teaching, I know she loves her students, because it's what she does. If you asked her, what do you want? She'd reply that she wants to be an English teacher. And that desire has pulled her into teaching English. That's what desires do. I could go around the room and I could, I could name off different things that many of you love, because I know you. If I could say, tell me about your grandkids, some of you would be like, oh, that's number one, that's me. Tell, tell me about the gun you just got for, after Christmas. I could ask Jim about his heartache, even though he's not here today. He's probably watching online. Jim, what, tell me about your heartache. I know what you love. 
Ruth Ann is also a Christian English teacher. And you see, that's probably where the, the big thing needs to come into play here. When I was a truck driver, I wasn't a guy who drove a truck. I was a Christian truck driver. And so my agenda was always to advance the cause of Christ with the people that I met, even if I was never going to see them again. Ruth Ann is a Christian English teacher. She desires, even with these students she hasn't seen, she's sent Bibles across the world. She's talked to students after class. She's talked to students in class about Jesus. That's what she loves. That's what you love, too. I know you talk to people about Jesus. Whatever you do this year, whatever you do this year, Resolve to make it a year where you look closely at your habits of life and align them to the loves that God wants you to have. It might involve some hard choices. It might involve some deep introspection. And there's a theme in my application in the last couple of weeks. Write it down. One of the ways that you can analyze what you really are doing with your time is every hour to write down what you did the past hour. Or at the end of the day, sort of reflect back and go, what did I do today? Write it down. Commit it to writing, and that way you'll be able to know. At the end of the week, you can go back and not wonder what you did on Tuesday. You wrote down on Tuesday what you did on Tuesday. And then ask yourself some hard questions. Do I love what God loves? Or am I foolishly seeking a Nobel Prize that doesn't matter? Am I foolishly seeking to be the best guy at finding internet memes? That doesn't matter. There's no prize in heaven for that. Am I the best guy at doing things that a kid can do with a cell phone? I should not be that. If your loves don't line up with God's, then that's the thing that needs to change. And that's true for us individually, and that's true for us as a body. Let's pray together. As the praise team comes up, as the guys get ready for the offering, um, let me <clears throat> pray with you. Father, I thank you so much for all that you've given us. I ask, Lord, that you help us, that you fill us up where we're weak, that you help us to discern what is best, and then to do that with enthusiasm. We love you, Father. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. One of the things, I, I am not a very administrative person. And I, I know that about myself. Um.